Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to really welcome Mary Ellen LaPianca on behalf of President Kurt Steinberg and the Montserrat College of Art. This conversation is an important component of our acknowledgement of the history of the country, Beverly, and the land that the school is on. We recognize our obligations to this land and to the indigenous people who care for it. As we work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion, we acknowledge our need to decolonize our systems. So join me in welcoming scholar and anthropologist, Mary Ellen LaPianca, to learn about the history of the land now known as Beverly. As LaPianca describes, the people living where Montserrat is now were the Pawtucket of Namkek. They welcomed the old planters of Salem Village, today's Beverly, and lived peaceably side by side with them during the first 50 years of English settlement. During the 18th and 19th centuries, however, their sites, history, homeland, and very identity were erased. Mary, Mary Ellen LaPianca is of Gloucester and is an independent scholar researching the history of Cape Ann from the last ice age to around 1700s. Mary Ellen's interest in local indigenous history and culture was sparked by Samuel D. Champlain's 1606 map of Le Beauport, now known as Gloucester, showing a wigwam on her street. Mary Ellen is currently a retired college instructor, textbook developer, author, and publisher with a master's degree in anthropology from Boston University and postgraduate work with the University of British Columbia. With that, please welcome Mary Ellen LaPianca. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is very exciting. This is my third online presentation, so I, I should not be too nervous about it. <laughs> um, so uh, it, this is about Beverly's indigenous people, and actually it extends to all the people of uh, Essex County. Uh, these are the questions that I had uh, asked myself at the beginning of my research, and um, they um, they are, you know, who were these people? Where did they come from? What were they doing here? Uh, how did were they able to adapt? Uh, why do we have all uh, misinformation about them and about their supposed disappearance? Where did they go and where are they now? These are very, very basic questions, but um, if you're from around here, you'll know that uh, there was very little information ever given. We were always told that there were no Indians here when the English settled. I'm now gonna try to look at present view because my notes are there. So tell me if this is working. Do you still see my slides? Okay, good. Then I, I can see my notes, so we're good. Uh, the people who lived here at the time of contact were the Pawtucket, and the colonists called them the Agawam Indians or the Namkeag Indians after their villages. They were a branch of the, uh, the Penacook who expanded into Essex County. Uh, from the lower Merrimack Valley of Southern New Hampshire. They spoke an ancient Abenaki language called Loop B, which unfortunately has no living speakers today. In the 16th and 17th centuries, their homelands uh, and sphere of influence extended in an arc from Lake Winnipesaukee down to Boston's North Shore. The Pawtucket were by no means the first people to live here. This area has been occupied by different groups of people for more than 12,000 years, for which there is ample archeological evidence. Uh, each of these four archeological periods has an early, middle, and late phase, different regional expressions, and diagnostic changes in technology and material culture. And we won't have time to go into all that today, People were in Beverly during all four periods, but my talk today is only about the last 750 years or so. The Pawtucket were among the descendants of the Eastern Woodland Indians known as the Algonquians. The Penacook Pawtucket homeland included Essex County and Northern Middlesex County. Their lives centered on the area's waterways and the resources of the watersheds, the Merrimack, the Shawshin, the Parker, the Ipswich, and the North Coastal watersheds. Geographically, Beverly is in the North Coastal watershed. This has many small rivers and streams, and in the north they empty into Ipswich Bay, and in the south they empty into Massachusetts Bay. Allied Pawtucket bands shared this territory and other native peoples freely traversed it. 
prior to European contact, indigenous people from the St. Lawrence down to the Chesapeake were all linked together through an extensive trading network. And there were very extensive uh, systems of alliance among the bands and tribes through uh, marriage also. Now the Pawtucket were not organized as a tribe. They did not have a sovereign territory. The, and neither did most of the other people in New England. The colonists applied concepts from European history to the people they encountered. So that historical map, such as this one by Sidney Purley, which shows that Aguam tribal territory uh, demarcated from a Namkiag tribal territory, misrepresent the political realities of indigenous life here. Agawam and Namkiag were just the names of principal villages in Ipswich and Beverly, respectively, which is uh, shown here by the red X's on this map. Pawtucket bands were voluntary, sometimes temporary. It included people who were both related and unrelated. They were not corporate entities like tribes or nations. And they were not led by chiefs, but by heads of high-ranking families in totemic patrilineages. Uh, their leaders known as Sagamores and Sockums, we're used to saying Sachems, but it's really Sockums, both inherited and earned their status. The colonists erroneously called them chiefs. Uh, and of course, over time, native peoples uh, came to accept European designations for them themselves. Through the splitting and joining of bands, the boundaries of Sagamore ships were constantly changing. For example, the territories uh, changed jurisdiction among these three uh, lineages, these three Penacook Pawtucket lineages, which were joined through marriage and alliance. Uh, Masconomet paid, or actually Masconomet paid tribute to Nana Pashamit's heirs after Nana Pashamit's death. And then after Masconomet's death in 15, 1658, the lands he administered came under the jurisdiction of Nana Pashamit's heirs in the South, which would, would have included Beverly and Salem, uh, and uh, in the North by Pasconaway's heirs. So um, you, as you can see, this was constantly shifting. Beverly, uh, for example, uh, was finally administered by Nana Pashamit's youngest son, Wenapoikan, or Sagamore George after uh, Masconomet had uh, passed away. All the Pawtucket heirs paid tribute to Pasconaway, whose real name was Papasakanua. He's the famous New Hampshire Sockham. And by 1640, all of, most of the people in Massachusetts had joined his powerful Penacook Confederacy. Agawam Village on the Castle Neck River in Essex Bay. This was the summer residence of the Sagamore Masconomet. I'm going to say Masconomet, even though uh, you know the English uh, really messed up a lot of the Algonquian names. Masconomet represented the people living in Essex County at the time of English contact. He had a farm on Argilla Road. He had a fort on Castle Island. He lived on Hog Island, which is today called Choate Island, and he conducted diplomacy on Castle Hill. Agawam means other side of the marsh and is aptly named, as you can see. This name was also applied to all of the area administered from Agawam Village at the time of contact, which extended from above the Merrimack down to Salem Sound and encompassed the Great Salt Marsh. And it was the tremendous resources of this area, the waterways, the Great Marsh, and the sea that enabled people to live here very well year round. The village of Namkiag, which is a corruption probably of Nahumkiak, was in North Beverly on the eastern bank of the Bass River, which the Pawtucket called the Wakwak. The Bass River drains Wenham Lake and the surrounding freshwater swamps and empties into Beverly Harbor. The people were growing corn on the lower slopes of the nearby hills. They canoed up the Ipswich River via the Miles River. They canoed to the ocean to just to the south via the Bass River. They trapped beavers at Beaver Pond. 
They fished for tom cod and frost fish brook in the winters. Nam Kiag uh, is, if you look at Wikipedia, it will tell you what it means fishing place. This is probably, as I said, a corruption of Nam Kiag, which is the word that the colonists first recorded phonetically. And it refers to an Abenaki word for eels rather than the Massachusetts word for fish. Eels were the favorite food of the striped bass for which the Bass River was named. And the indigenous, indigenous people prized eels both for the meat and the skin. The, the dried and crushed bones of eels, they added to baby food as a source of calcium. And the dressed eels made very strong and soft uh, hair ribbons, backpacks, wraps, moccasin laces, and cradleboard ties. Most Algonquian place names describe geographic features or the subsistence resources to be found in a place but Algonquian place names is another whole different presentation, another thing that we don't have time for today. At the time of European contact, the Beverly Salem area marked the southern extent of the Pawtucket Range. They were flanked by Abenaki people to their north, Nipmuc, Pocumtuck, and Mohican people to the west, and the Massachusetts people to the south. And these were their allies and trading partners. The Pawtucket were not involved with the people living on the South Shore, particularly such as the Wampanoags, nor with other peoples of Southern New England, such as the Narragansett and the Pequot and so on. They had different cultures. They spoke different languages, although they also understood each other's languages uh, through their trading networks. School children today only hear about the Wampanoags who were the descendants of the people the pilgrims met on the South Shore. They are the only indigenous people in Massachusetts to have official state and federal recognition today. Pawtucket bands cited their settlements at river junctions, lake outlets, marsh drainages and estuaries. And for most of their history, they migrated seasonally back and forth between a winter village in Wamiset which is Lowell, at the junction of the Merrimack and the Concord Rivers, and the coast, where they went both to the Gulf of Maine and to Salem Sound, everywhere from Plum Island to Marblehead. And these are all distances of less than 30 miles. So the idea that they were nomads is incorrect. These were the 16 largest villages of the Pawtucket at the time of contact, as recorded incorrectly by the English representing an estimated population of between eight and 12,000 people. So-called Wanasquam was in Gloucester, Shenawemedy is Topsfield, Quaskakunquen is in Newbury, Katichuit is Andover. And the real names, as I mentioned, are quite different. Uh, and it's 10 o'clock. Oh, sorry about that. It's my computer telling me the time. Um, I have to do that to make sure I stand up every hour. <laughs> that the blood could circulate. Um, in any case, um, if you go to Wikipedia and look up the names of uh, the native names of some of these our places, they are usually incorrect. They don't mean what uh, websites from the towns and Wikipedia entries claim. But my point here is that they were really all the same people. They referred to themselves as Ninoak, the people here. Based on archaeological evidence, this is what a seasonal settlement looked like when different bands came together in one place in the spring or fall, and such places later became the sites of their palisaded winter refuges and their agricultural villages. And everyone had equal access to spring fish runs at the waterfalls, egg gathering on the offshore islands, summer corn harvests, fall eel runs on the coast, and duck hunts on the lakes, and turkey hunts and game drives in the forests. The people were growing maize or Indian corn on the slopes of southwest facing uplands. They cleared gentle hillsides through the slash and burn method, and they planted in mounds in contour lines, perpendicular to the direction of groundwater flows. 
because they did not irrigate and coastal river systems do not support agriculture well. The tidal streams are too salty. Uh, the uh, streams are too unpredictable for flooding and drying up here. Our floodplains are too narrow and the freshwater marshes are too wet for corn. The people used fire to clear vast tracts of forest as parkland to attract game and to prepare the soil for future cultivation. Everything to do with plant food was women's work. In this, this uh, artist's representation, which I'm sorry, it looks a little pixelated on my screen. Uh, the uh, women and children are harvesting corn for the Green Corn Festival in July and gourds have been left on the ground to harden for use as water containers. The boy on the platform is doing his stint as a scarecrow. He has a small arsenal of stones up there to throw at the crows. In addition to communal agriculture, each family had allocated campsites for their own seasonal resource procurement, and they always had a kitchen garden with it. In their gardens, they grew squash, beans, peas, pumpkins, Jerusalem artichokes, which are not artichokes in the sense that we think, uh, tobacco, and sunflowers, along with whatever their favorite variety of corn was. And this is what a three-season family campsite would have looked like. Wigwam slept as many as 10 people. This one still has its winter covering of oak bark, so it's early summer. When it gets hot, the oak panels and insulating material will be removed and replaced with paper birch, thatch, or woven mats. The poles across the entrance mean nobody's home, probably gone fishing in the stream behind those trees, or took their canoes to go visiting. They likely had a winter camp elsewhere as well, where they would be near the family's trap lines, firewood cache, and a beaver dam or a trout stream. In addition to growing domesticated crops, the people harvested northern wild rice and they gathered the great variety of edible fruits, uh, nuts, mushrooms, flowers, berries, seeds, bulbs, tubers, roots, and herbs that still all grow wild here. They made fruit leathers, meat jerkies, nut butters, clam juice, hush puppies, and popcorn. They harvested fish, shellfish, marine mammals, birds and fowl, and all manner of large and small game. They dried, smoked, or fermented all those foodstuffs to preserve and to use in trade. For example, dried clam meats were a luxury item for their inland trading partners. They also traded blocks of stone that they quarried here, because there are many other places that don't have stone. The indigenous people ate much better than the colonists at first. And early on, the English commodified Indian corn as an official form of currency for colonists and Indians alike. The first European contact was made by the French at the beginning of the 17th century. Samuel de Champlain's map of Lerbo Port, which is Gloucester Harbor, shows the Pawtucket wigwams with kitchen gardens, the cleared parkland, and the managed groves in 1606. And there was a wigwam on my street where I live in the Red Circle. And that's what got me started on my inquiry. I couldn't uh, look at my backyard without wondering who they were. And I also wanted my grandchildren to know about indigenous history here. And so as a retiree, I had a, a new hobby and here it is 10 years later and I'm, I'm an expert. Uh, this is an illustration from Champlain's expedition showing a Pawtucket game drive near here. This is different than what uh, we usually think of. We think of the Indians with their bows and arrows in the woods, but they actually conducted game drives and they hunted game using similar methods to the way they fished with their fish weirs. Champlain's account includes illustrations of the people he saw in the lower Merrimack Valley in 1604. He called them the Almuchiqua. Uh, the woman is holding a squash in one hand and an ear of corn in the other. 
Her husband appears with his hunting and fishing gear. And those are Jerusalem artichokes, which have edible tubers that are growing between them. The woman who is pounding corn in a log mortar, Champlain saw her on Cape Ann in 1606. The Europeans were very impressed with the greater height, size, and physical fitness of the indigenous people. And here's an idea of how they lived. Um, and, and if I go too fast so that you don't have time to read the slides, uh, somebody let me know and I'll slow down. But here's an idea of what they did in the spring. It was a time for gathering building material and repairing things, setting the nets and weirs, preparing the fields for planting, exploiting the spring fish runs, gathering the first fresh foods of the season, and tending to the burial or reburial of people who had died over the winter. And spring in the medicine wheel, which is shown on the right, um, is represented by this the color of uh, yellow. Summer was just as busy, but colonists often described the Indians as idle, with women doing all the work. As it happens, many summer activities involve gathering, and gathering was the work of women and children. Men went on hunting, fowling, fishing, and quarrying expeditions. Work was done in spurts rather than sustained, and once crops were planted and there was fresh meat, the people turned to domestic activities and partying. They had many competitive games and sports, and gambling was a traditional pastime for all the Algonquian peoples. Also in the summertime, the herbalists prepared medicines, women dressed deerskins, and everybody made clay pots and splint baskets. Fall was the time to complete all of the final harvests of the season's plants and animals. There was a cranberry festival and a turkey hunt. Fall was the time to go on trading and raiding expeditions and to go visiting distant relatives, to go on spiritual pilgrimages, which was a tradition, and to observe their ceremonial calendar. And they had to prepare for winter. In fall, they cached the year's food surpluses and supplies for the following year. Winter activities featured clothing production, arts and crafts, specialized hunting, such as beaver trapping, moose hunting, and the annual bear hunt, ice fishing on the lakes, making wampum beads from shells, boiling sweet syrups from tree saps. Winter evenings were for telling stories about the Abenaki culture hero, Glooskap, how Glooskap gave the animals their names, taught people how to live, and outwitted evil spirits. Seasonal activities followed the medicine wheel, again shown on the right in the inset. This is a spiritual concept of the world around which Algonquian life was organized, as well as uh, with astronomical reckonings and a belief that people, animals, trees, and rocks are all endowed with character and spiritual power or mana tool. The four colors of the medicine wheel represent the four cardinal directions, the four seasons, four stages of life, four states of mind, and four sources of illness and health. Above the circle is the sky world, and below it is the water world. At the center is the sacred tree of life or the sacred fire. The circle also represents the turtle on whose back the creator had the world built with mud from the bottom of the water world. The turtle's shell also marks out the 13 lunar months. The people used boulders and skyline features to track the lunar and solar cycles, and they created ceremonial stone landscapes that are still here. For them, time was not linear and did not pass. Time was circular and recursive. All times, past and future, history and prophecy, were all manifested in a never-ending present. 
So that's how the Pawtucket were making their living in Ag Guam and Homkiak at the time of European settlement. They were following a seasonal round of subsistence activities, observing the solstices, which are the yellow stars, and the equinoxes, or the green stars. They were planting domesticated crops, and they were leaving offerings to spirits in the crevices of rocks. Their way of life and that of the English colonists could not have been more different. The Pawtucket at Namkiag first received the first English settlers in 1625. And this was a small group of Puritans from Cape Ann whose plantation had failed. And that's another story. Their backers in England had asked Roger Conant to come up from Plymouth to lead them. But when Conant got to Cape Ann, he saw that the people were not going to be able to survive the winter there. A Pawtucket warrior guided them 12 miles south to Namkiag, where the people took them in and fed them until they could make another go of building a community. And this is the route they took from Fisherman's Field in Gloucester to Namkiag on the Bass River in North Beverly. They took Old Salem Road through Raven's Wood to Route 127, which was an Indian trail. The English named their settlement Salem Village and established a fishing post at Beverly Harbor on Fish Flake Hill, which is down on Front Street. The people in Salem Village became known as the Old Planters after the Dorchester Company morphed into the New England Company in 1628 and sent John Endicott to govern, along with another fleet of new settlers, the so-called Higginson Fleet in 1629. Endicott and the new settlers moved across the river to Salem on land granted to them by Masconomet, leaving the Old Planters in Beverly to plant side by side with the Pawtucket. And they lived peacefully together over the next 40 or 50 years. Then in 1630, the New England Company morphed into the Massachusetts Bay Company and sent John Winthrop to govern along with another fleet of new settlers. The Pawtucket canoed Masconomet out to greet Winthrop on the Arbella as it lay at anchor in Beverly Waters. It was either uh, uh, at uh, Mackerel Cove off of Dane, the Dane Street Beach, or it was off Beverly Cove uh, off of Patch Beach. Winthrop noted in his journal only that some savages had come aboard and were given trinkets. From day one, at every opportunity, Masconomet negotiated for steel knives, copper pots, and guns. One of the first recorded ordinances of the Bass Bay Colony uh, is an injunction against Masconomet going house to house to ask for things. Winthrop, meanwhile, moved the seat of government from Salem to Dorchester and Charlestown with a port at Roxbury. And over the next 10 years, upwards of 20,000 English landed at Roxbury and Plymouth in what came to be known as the Great Migration. What started as a welcome contact with technologically superior people rapidly became a source of profound culture shock. The Pawtucket had welcomed the English with open arms. In addition to metal goods and guns, they sought protection from their native enemies. Masconomet's enemies on the east were the so-called Tarantines, the Micmac or Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, the Maliseet, Maliseet or, or Malastakawiwiak, the Passamaquoddy, who were really the Pescatomatadi, and sometimes the Penobscot, who called themselves the Panawapskek. Enemies to the west were the Iroquoians, especially the Mohawk or Kanyan Kahaka. The Algonquians of New England lost all their wars because the Tarantines and the Iroquois were better armed through their contacts with the French and the Dutch. The Tarantines annually canoed down the coast to raid Pawtucket and Massachusetts farms for corn, which would not grow at their high latitudes. And the Mohawks wanted fur trade territory 
in the Connecticut Valley, the Champlain Valley, and the Merrimack. These wars, uh, the native wars, were intergenerational and they were conducted on the principle of blood vengeance. At the same time, the Pawtucket and all the others were pawns in ongoing competition between the French, English, and Dutch for New England land, ports, and commodities, especially furs, but also metal ores, ship masts, sassafras, which was believed to cure syphilis, and tar made from pine pitch. The Pennacook, Pawtucket, Sagamore ships, and Sachem ships were caught in the middle. The Pawtucket had forts and watch towels, towers at the entrances of the rivers where the Tarantines attacked, including here in Beverly Salem. Edward Winslow, exploring from Plymouth in 1624, called these native forts castles. And place names we have today that include the word castle very likely refer to the locations of native defensive positions. The two big forts here were in Marblehead, which was Nana Passionate's summer home, and on Castle Hill in the North River. The Pawtucket names for these rivers were recorded in an early deed going clockwise from the village of Namkeag to the village of, of Wakwamisakok are the Wakwak or Bass, the Orcasant, which is the Danvers River, the Massabequash, which is the Forest River, the Soamapaneset, which is the North River, river the Kanonabskanukan, which is the Waters River, and the Puamanukan, which is the Crane River. I always wonder if I'm gonna get through those names, <laughs> but I did. Uh, in 1632, Winthrop sent his son, John Winthrop Jr., and some men from Charlestown to survey Agawam for a plantation, which became Ipswich, as a buffer against French incursions into Maine. And he happened to arrive just in time to help Masconomet repel a Tarantine attack on Castle Hill in Ipswich following a previous deadly attack uh, the previous year. Winthrop Jr. aided uh, the Pawtucket again in 1634. And in gratitude, in 1637, Mastodomit sold Castle Hill and his farm on Agela Road to Winthrop Jr. And he invited the English to occupy his fort on Castle Island. The very next year, Mastodomit sold the rest of Greater Agawam to the English for 20 pounds sterling. So let's start a timeline now to see how the English and the native people reacted and adapted to each other here. During the early 17th century references to Masconomet in town records, um, the notes are dismissive and sometimes even comical. Early on, he's banned from going from house to house to ask for things or to request aid against his enemies. And more than once, English intervention saves them from defeat at the hands of their enemies. Uh, the initial culture shock is overshadowed by two key events. First, population loss from the second virgin soil epidemic, which was smallpox, a viral disease. The first epidemic, which had uh, spread down the coast prior to 1620, was a bacterial disease leptospirosis. And the second event uh, that overshadowed the culture shock was the Pequot War in southern New England. This was the first conflict in which the English destroyed the Pequot in retribution for the assassination of a uh, dishonest trader by unknown parties as he canoed up the Connecticut River. Uh, but that again is another whole story. The, the English uh, sent the Pequot into slavery in Barbados. They uh, changed the name of uh, Pequot Village to New London, Connecticut. And the name of the river was changed from the Pequot River to the Thames. And the court passed a law saying that it would be illegal for anyone to utter the name Pequot.
during the first 50 years of settlement, the indigenous people adapted uh, it in these ways in New England. They had already experienced more than 100 years of European contact prior to English settlement. They had participated in the fur trade and served as guides and translators for explorers. The Mayflower people were greeted in English by an Abnaki Sachem or Sachem by the name of uh, Samoset. He was a, an Abnaki from Maine who had learned the language from Englishmen fishing on Monhegan Island. And he happened to be on the South shore of Massachusetts on a pilgrimage. And he said, hello, English, to William Bradford's party on Plymouth Beach. Some native people sought to assimilate. They converted to Christianity, adopted colonial dress, oh, fenced their farms, sorry about that, uh, raised cattle, apprenticed in trades, and married indentured servants or the colonists' African slaves. Many Native Amer uh, Americans in New England today are Black. Other peoples remain committed to traditional ways and just distance themselves or moved away entirely. Algonquians had a long-standing tradition of moving away from any place where illness, unpleasantness, bad luck, or unwanted violence occurred, which they believed was caused by the presence of evil spirits. The Pequot War was a uh, turning point, uh, and uh, let's see, am I on the, the right slide? All right, yes. After 1640, the records uh, begin to show ambivalence. Uh, the Mass Bay Colony began with every intention of treating the people fairly on paper. Um, but soon, uh, colonists may or may not have guns or gunpowder. They may or may not buy land directly. They may or may not use alcohol and trade, may or may not uh, be apprenticed or pressed into service and so on, may or may not be expected to become Christians. It becomes very uh, ambivalent. So then we come to another major turning point, and that is the Oath of 1644. In 1644, leaders of the Penacook, Pawtucket, and other groups pledged that they would become Christians, obey English laws, follow English customs, and remain neutral in any future conflicts. However, right after that, powwows were made illegal and Indians could be enslaved. So soon, the period of ambivalence is going to harden. And the story of this uh, is that on March 8, 1644, Maskinamon appeared in the Salem Circuit Court, Governor John Winthrop and the Puritan minister Richard Mather presiding. With Maskinamon were Kuchimakan of Kuchichuik, Josiah Chickatawbit of Nonantum, which is uh, present day Newton and Brookline, Nashakawam of Nashua, New Hampshire, who was a Penacook, Wasamagan of Wachusett, who was a Nipmuc, and Nana Pashamit's widow, Squaw Sockham, and her sole surviving son from the smallpox epidemic of 1633, who is Wanapoikan, later known as George No Nose. And the next day, the great Passaconaque himself and his eldest son, Nanamakamuk, added their signatures to the oath of 1644. But English protection came at a price. In addition to becoming Christians and obeying the Ten Commandments and observing the Sabbath and having their children instructed in how to be English, they had to refrain from behavior that the Puritans regarded as immoral. And that included sorcery, which was an Algonquian tradition, blasphemy, idleness, nudity, dancing, and specified sex acts. The Indians had to adhere to these conditions. How do you think they answered these questions? Uh, Reverend Mitch, Richard Mather recorded their answers, and this is what he wrote that he said that he says they said. Answer to question one. We do desire to reverence the God of the English and to speak well of him, 
because we see he doth better to the English than other gods do to others. Answer to question two, we know not what swearing is. Answer to question three, it is easy to us. We have not much to do any day and we can well rest on that day. Answer to question four, it is our custom to do so for inferiors to honor superiors. Answer to question five, this is good and we desire so to do. Answer to question six, after considerable explanation. Though some of our people do these things occasionally, yet we count them not and do not allow them. Answer to question seven, we say the same to this as to the sixth question. Answer to question eight, we will allow this as opportunity will permit, and as the English live among us, we desire so to do. Answer to question nine, we will. To seal the deal, the six leaders were uh, paid out 26 fathoms of wampum. That amounts to 6,240 shell beads, roughly 624 colonial dollars in value. They were essentially buying protection by paying tribute. In turn, each was given two yards of red woolen cloth and a pot of wine. The Puritan ministers wrote home that a new age of spreading the gospel among the Indians had begun, and the Indians went home with word that a new age had begun of living under the protection of English law. But it was really already too late. The record shows that indigenous people at first did receive the full benefits of English justice in trial courts. But then it becomes unclear, uh, unclear. They may or may not be indentured or apprenticed. They may or may not have horses. They may or may not have boats. They may or may not leave their villages. Uh, some were persecuted along with the Quakers who defended them. And many were seen as devil worshipers along with the colonists accused of witchcraft during the famous uh, witchcraft uh, delusion uh, the Salem witchcraft trials. Algonquians did practice sorcery. But the ambivalence disappeared with the final turning point, which was uh, Metacomet's Wampanoag War of 1675. This is undoubtedly the greatest turning point in indigenous history in uh, New England. This was known as King Philip's War after Metacomet's Christian name. Metacomet was the second son of Massasoit of the Poconoke, whose eldest son, Wam Sutta, or Alexander, had argued unsuccessfully for peace after their father, Massasoit, died. After this war, no native people were able to sustain their neutrality with disastrous consequences over the next hundred years. This war needs another whole telling, and there are some excellent new uh, histories of, the, of King Philip's War. Uh, but we don't have time for this today, uh, but these are the main points. The Wampanoag War against the English made all Indians enemies of the state, and indigenous people were not able to unite effectively against a common enemy. Uh, their cultural and intentional differences between Native people and European colonists had become too great to reconcile. Meanwhile, the first generation of the contact period was dying off. It's good that uh, Maskanamet, uh, known to colonists by his Christian name of Sagamore John, did not live to see the end of days for Pawtucket in Massachusetts. He had given his children Christian names and received a Christian burial in 1658. His English grave site, along with that of his wife and unknown others, is at Sagamore Hill in South Hamilton, which is now under the stewardship of the Essex County Greenbelt Association. This site is still tended by Native people. 
In 1700 and 1701, Maskinamit's grandchildren signed the quitclaim deeds to each of the towns that had been formed from the Agawam land that Maskinamit had originally sold. Here is the quitclaim deed to Beverly, signed in 1700 by Joseph English, Samuel English and his wife Susanna, and Jeremiah Walchus and his wife Betty. These and other grandchildren of Maskinamit have living descendants today. After 1675, people who could fled to the boondocks, returning whenever things seemed safe and then going away again when they weren't. There was a lot of back and forth. Some went to praying Indian towns, which were intended to protect, to protect them by making them modern, i.e. Christians with clothes, permanent houses, fenced farms, domesticated animals. The Indian slave market and debarkation point for the offshore slave plantations was in Charleston, South Carolina. As slaves, indigenous people mixed with Africans, both at home and abroad. And many of their descendants were later denied tribal recognition because of their mixed race, just as indigenous people who mixed with Europeans were denied recognition, usually either as native or white part of the continuing legacy of Anglo-European racism. Most, but not all, Penacook and Pawtucket remained neutral in King Philip's War, but after it started, survivors sought sanctuaries in neutral communities, making neutrality impossible. And no one who could be identified as indigenous was safe. In 1688, Massachusetts offered its first bounties on Indian scalps, an incentive that lasted off and on for the next 90 odd years up to the War of Independence. In the aftermath of the war, whole families were enslaved with the men exported to the Caribbean. The women and children were given as rewards, sold for income or divvied up among the towns. Agawam and Namkiag were finally abandoned in 1696, following the sack of Wemiset. Some colonists got commissions for scalp hunting expeditions for bounty money. Uh, and as late as 1773, on the eve of the American Revolution, American, uh, you know, Indian scalps were still hanging from the rafters in the Salem courthouse. In that year, the magistrates requested that the scalps be removed because of, quote, unsightliness and falling dust, end of quote. Any indigenous people remaining became invisible. They stopped practicing their religion. They stopped speaking their language. They stopped telling their children who they were. So how come we didn't know about all this? All this came as a great surprise to me. And the more I researched and the more I learned, the more surprised I was at how much we don't, didn't know all this. English histories uh, of all the first towns don't say much about the native people they lived among. Most coastal New England town histories and vital records and centennial addresses dismiss the subject, except in reference to deeds, treaties, accusations of mischief, fears of uprisings, and laws regula regulating commerce with them. In town after town, history begins with the quitclaim deed signed by the local Sagamores and Sockums with their notarized signatory marks. Memory of them was erased, written out of local histories, scoured from public records and from the landscape. Most 19th century histories begin with a paragraph like this one from Lamson's History of Manchester by the Sea. The history of America begins with the advent of Europeans in the New World. The red men in small and scattered bands roamed the stately forests and interminable prairies, hunted the bison and the deer, fished the lakes and streams, gathered around the council fire, and danced the war dance. But they planted no states, founded no cities, established no manufactures, engaged in no commerce, cultivated no arts, built up no civilization. 
They left their names upon mountains and rivers, but they made no other impress upon the continent which from time immemorial had been their dwelling place. The record of their past vanishes like one of their own forays into the wilderness. Their shell heaps and their graves are the only remains left to show what, that they once called these lands their own. They made no history. Your own early history uh, by Stone, written in 1843, begins with only two sentences referring to Indians about how Sagamore John freely gave Namkiag to the English. Today, scholars refer to this phenomenon as erasure. The narratives about the disappearance of the mysterious Indians were told to deny responsibility for what was being done to them. Uh, this includes uh, the politics uh, of the archives. There are lots of narratives that are in the erasure narratives. Among them, one is that the Indians had more land than they needed or knew what to do with. They died out because of disease and native warfare. There were no none here by the time the English settled. They were only nomads and nomads and didn't really live anywhere. Uh, they really could not adapt to becoming modern. Uh, they vanished naturally as the wilderness was tamed. Nobody knows anything about them because they didn't write their history. New Englanders were abolitionists and favored emancipation. In New England, we did not practice slavery. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, to take one example of the from, of an, from an extinction narrative, here's a French Jesuit's drawing of a smallpox outbreak in 1725 among the Abnakis. In reality, as devastating as the epidemics were, survival rates were extremely variable, uh, with more survival in the north than in the south. And most indigenous populations began recovering within a generation through acquired immunity. There were factors other than disease that were affecting population, including voluntary relocations, political realignments, the dislocation of landless families caused by the loss of land. Other factors affecting population were the scarcities caused by economic dependence on the colonists, not to mention all the efforts to enslave or exterminate them. Information about these other causes of population decline has been suppressed. It's a lot easier to just have the Indians die off from disease and disappear from the landscape. So these are some of the factors that uh, uh, caused the uh, stories of erasure to be told. Uh, there had to be foundation myths, uh, superior accomplishments of the founding fathers to be proud of. Um, and, and of course, you have, you know, our classic uh, uh, racism, which is still a problem, as recent events indicate. Uh, the, there were, every town had a last Indian uh, because of beliefs about racial purity. Um, and the status of slave of native people as slaves and indentured servants, debtors, wards of the state, subject to poverty and alcoholism was regarded as proof of uh, degeneracy. The degeneracy narrative went along with the extinction narrative. The, the towns that uh, all talked about their last Indian, those last Indians had offspring uh, who, however, were uh, not, quote, pure, end of quote, and therefore no longer Indian. This, if you for Native Americans, uh, one drop of white blood did not make you white, but you were also no longer an Indian. This is uh, the opposite to the one drop rule applied to blacks, in which one drop makes you black, whatever else you have in you. So, um, And then you also had Native groups who discriminate against each other. And another reason, of course, the principal reason, I, in my opinion, for these uh, erasure narratives is the fact that there were skeletons in the closet, facts that, if known, might make us not quite so proud of our colonial ancestors. And by the late 19th century, the truth had been replaced with romantic notions 
and heroic stories about the vanishing Indian, the last Indian. This is an example of the they had no civilization narrative. And this is old. European superiority was expressed by every group making contact, beginning with Verrazano in 1524. It was based mainly on differences in material culture, religion, and the concept of modernity. Everywhere they colonized, the Europeans believed it was natural that indigenous people should be replaced by people who were more modern and civilized. This is the first seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony with a naked Indian with a downward pointing arrow, which uh, is a symbol of defeat. And if you can read his speech bubble, which is upside down, it says, come over and help us. Here are some of the places where the Pawtucket and Penacook went. They, their diaspora was in waves beginning in 1645 and ending pretty much in 1696. There's no good news here, just the facts of survival, persistence, and resilience. Those who had assimilated or fled north avoid having their descendants shipped to reservations west of the Mississippi following passage of the Indian Removal Act during uh, Andrew Jackson's administration. The forced migration of the Cherokee was not the only trail of tears. So our histories have not told the truth about the Native Americans of New England because there's little to be proud of in the way they were treated. But the fact is that they have survived and persisted and reconstituted themselves and they are with us today. I found out that most of the native lineages of the 17th century have living descendants today. I've taken all this time for them to risk making themselves visible again, almost too late to reconstitute their cultures and communities. The people who were at Wamiset went to uh, reservations uh, in St. Francis, Quebec, at Odenac and Becancourt. And here on the left are descendants of the Penacook Pawtucket at Odenac, circa 1890. The family on the right visited Gloucester in the summer of 1907. All along, descendants have made pilgrimages uh, to traditional sites in Massachusetts whenever it was safe to do so. And they still do. Here are the descendants at Odenac today. These are descendants of the Penacook who were shipwrecked in 1676 on their way to slave plantations. And they live on St. David's Island in Bermuda today. Here are descendants in Wisconsin on the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation today. Their black bear regalia that the, their uh, shaman is wearing are symbols of Masconomet's lineage. The feathers the people are carrying are prayer wands. And if you see Wisconsin license plates in Massachusetts in the summertime, consider the possibility that the people are descendants of indigenous people who lived here on pilgrimage. And they are also here. In 2010, nearly 19,000 Massachusetts residents identified themselves as Native American, more than 2,700 of them in Essex County alone. According to that census, an additional 37,000 individuals said that they were more than one race, including Native American. So taken at face value and ignoring sampling errors, the number of people with indigenous ancestry is actually probably much higher. People with DNA kits are discovering native ancestors for the first time. So they did not disappear. Their populations continue to recover and grow. Many of their landscapes are still here, such as these forests, water bodies, wildlife refuges and reservations. Other legacies, such as their ceremonial stone landscapes and petroglyphs, are hidden in plain sight all around us, such as uh, Shiprock and Peabody, 
the stone mound on Snake Hill in Beverly, the split boulders and rock shelters such as this one in Anasquam. And we might respect, celebrate, preserve, protect these things and embrace our indigenous heritage as well as our colonial one. We at least should get the story straight and make sure the truth is passed on. New scholarship is exposing the falsehoods that are in the erasure narratives, but the work of revising the official history texts remains. It's only been 50 years that New England's indigenous people have been rediscovered as not so vanished, and they've become politically active, intent on restoring culture, reclaiming land, expressing traditional and spiritual beliefs, protecting sacred sites, and creating new remixed native communities, teaching their children to express pride in their native identity and to practice native arts. Language revival programs and genealogical databases are starting to reveal the full extent of indigenous New England survival. Powwows are celebrations of that survival and a means by which they reconstruct, share, and transmit a cultural heritage that could not be erased after all. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> I'm glad to answer questions. And um, my bibliography is now about 53 pages, single spaced. But if anybody actually has to see my bibliography, I'll be glad to share it. <laughs> Um, I know there are some questions. Is there a place where we could go for more information? The, the, the Ipswich History website was something where your work appeared. Um, yes. Uh, Historic Ipswich is one uh, place. I have several essays on there. There's also a blog called Enduring Gloucester. Uh, which is where I live, and they have many uh, essays there. Uh, and seven chapters of my book are online at kpnhistory.org. Uh, I'm still working on my book. I've been working on my book forever, but I uh, hope to put up more chapters soon. Uh, my professional articles uh, are in the uh, Bulletin of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And I have, I think, five or six uh, papers that have been published there and two more that are coming out uh, this fall. Right. Uh, there, and as for other sources, there really are none. <laughs> uh, well, there are none in our area. There, I, I can't tell you how much I've scoured every bit of print available in everybody's library, archive, museum, and, and so on and so forth. And there's uh, the early histories. No histories have been done of this area since uh, the Victorian era, uh, except very specialized ones like the the history of art here or the history of the granite here or something like that. Uh, but no attention to indigenous history. So uh, so I can't really refer you to a uh, to other histories specifically for our area for Essex County. Are there any questions from uh, anyone online or in um, in uh, in the room? Uh, yeah, also respond to questions by email. If uh, people email me, it's emmylepianca at comcast.net and uh, try to answer questions. It's a lot of material. I, I probably swamped you with information, but um, so it's, it's, I should have mentioned at the very beginning that if you had questions, it would be best to jot them down. Uh, uh, I certainly had questions one after another and, uh, and uh, thinking naively that uh, a summer project was going to answer my questions, but um, it's taken me all this time and I still have questions. I'm actually having to learn Algonquian languages now <laughs> just in order to access native texts, indigenous texts, which do exist. So... So 
my uh, my grandchildren's teachers used to invite me to their classes uh, to show the children how to make dream catchers and how big wigwams were built and things like that. But it was shocking to me how little information they got actually no information about local history, certainly not anything about local indigenous history. So I became very concerned about that. I thought there ought to be more of an effort to tell the whole story and to speak the truth and to uh, uh, have this be a basis for a, a new a new age of social justice, which I hope we're coming to. Mary Ellen, we have an interesting question in the chat. Someone asked that in light of the upcoming holiday, could you say something about where this notion of Thanksgiving came from and how its origins have been so misunderstood? Um, I'm not sure about the exact history, but I think Thanksgiving was not declared as such until the mid 19th century. And I think it was uh, invented by a woman somewhere who thought that there should uh, be this. Uh, but, but I but I don't know the specifics of it. I do know that it was not a an Algonquian tradition. Uh, they had several, they celebrated Thanksgiving uh, every season. Uh, they had a celebration for every harvest uh, of every uh, natural resource or, uh, you know, crop, corn crop. Um, and it wasn't just in the fall. They had, they had those celebrations of Thanksgiving all year round. Um, if anybody else knows this, uh, maybe they could say, probably somebody listening knows the answer to that question better than I do. I know that the Wampanoag people call it uh, a day of mourning. They don't celebrate Thanksgiving. It's called a day of mourning. It's, it's a, a whitewash. Uh, it's part of the narratives of erasure, the idea that the colonists and the native people got along so well together. Uh, and, uh, that, and this is uh, the idea of a shared Thanksgiving is supposed to be emblematic of this wonderfully positive relationship. And of course, the, the pilgrims on the South Shore, who were not the same as the Puritans up here on the North Shore, these are different people, but, uh, basically. Um, but uh, the, the pilgrims, pillaged uh, the communities they encountered, uh, dug up their stored food, um, stole things from them and so on. There was, it was not a, uh, there was not a good relationship from the very start, uh, generally. So it, to me, it's all part of the sort of the uh, purification of unpleasant events to make them palatable for descendants of, of colonists. Uh, and that's all coming apart now on many fronts. So I hope it hope that continues. S talks I've given uh, have been revelatory. The, the DAR had me come talk and I'm sure they thought they were gonna hear about how wonderful the colonists and the Indians got along. Uh, so they were a little surprised, <laughs> but. Well, that actually brings up another question from a, from another student who was curious if you were an activist for Native Americans aside from your research and do you have any other side projects and even more so how we can get involved to help with the fight and uh, for just more acknowledgement. I, those are great questions and uh, this is a good time to be involved. Uh, I, I'm not really a, I mean, I'm an, I'm an old new left. I met Martin, Martin Luther King. Um, you know, so this is <laughs> this is uh, my demonstrating days and so on are are are, uh, are pretty much past. I don't pick it anymore and so on, but I do support the um, uh, Western Indians in their efforts to save their lands from destruction by the extraction of minerals from their sacred grounds and things like that. I think one problem is that Massachusetts, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, does not does not recognize uh, any above ground stone structures as native in origin. Uh, so it's very difficult to save landscapes from development. Um, but that would be a, a very good way if in your community, if you find 
uh, native landscapes, working to keep them safe from development would be a really major thing to do. It's preserving their, preserving that part of our heritage, our collective heritage, uh, to preserve those things. So, um, and then, um, you know, I, uh, I think uh, any any legislation that is supports native rights their ability you know the the thing about casinos is that is a brilliant strategy for native people both algonquians and iroquoians uh, they're taking something from their own traditional culture and monetizing it so that they can sustain a traditional way of life uh it's not nothing to do with vice uh get the association of gambling with vice is not native it's not indigenous, so it's a completely different uh, conception, but very hard to put across in communities that think that they're inviting crime by having a casino. Uh, so I think I, I think it would be very good for everyone to go to a powwow to which outsiders are attended and to really observe. Um, and because uh, because it's difficult, there's been such a long history of uh of of disrespect and uh suspicion uh, as an anthropologist i have not been uh given access to a lot of people and places that i would have liked to talk to uh, the tribal council on indian island in maine told me that they did not want to talk about their attacks <laughs> for their corn raids during the 17th century they just thought that sleeping dogs should be left asleep uh, and uh, I was other people's have other native people that I've tried to reach out to have been friendly only to a certain point there's just been especially for archaeologists and anthropologists a very long history of abuses digging up their graves, putting their material goods in museums and so on. So but I think anything that that uh, people could do to reach out to their native communities would be great. And that actually brings up a, another question in chat that someone is curious about terminology in terms of the phrasing Native American, Indian, First Nation, Indigenous, um, what are you finding is the most accurate or most uh, correct use? Well, it's what they want to be called. And according to a couple of videos I've seen recently, uh, they don't want to, Native American is not as uh, attractive as simply indigenous. So indigenous people seems to be the politically correct thing today based on what uh, indigenous people themselves prefer. And of course that changes changes with every generation, really. It's 11 o'clock. Oh, that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> I'll stand up. There. Well, unless there are any other questions, Mary Ellen, just thank you so much for the time. It's just an incredible lecture. We're just so lucky. We hope to have you back sometime soon. Oh, thank you very much. I have like 10 other presentations on related topics. <laughs> um, and it's been it's been delightful. And as I say, I'm uh, happy to have you share my email address. If there are other questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much and have a great day. You too. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye.